welcome to our worship this Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday is, I'm sorry, let me take this off. Trinity Sunday is kind of an unusual celebration in one sense. Most of the festivals that we have in the church year, in fact, all of them except really Trinity Sunday, are because of some special event like Christmas or Easter or Pentecost. And apparently Trinity Sunday, which is really commemorating a doctrine rather than an event per se, it was something that was um, pushed forward by lay people, not clergy. And you might think that's kind of strange. I think it was kind of strange um, because when we think of Trinity, we think of kind of a mystery, don't we? It is not something that's part of our everyday language. But you'll find as we go through the service today that there's a close connection between Pentecost and Trinity. Um, the reading, for example, um, in Acts, it's just a continuation of the reading from last Sunday where we have this message of the Apostle Peter in which so many people were converted by the power of the Holy Spirit. So more to that as we have our worship service today. Welcome to those of you who are, <clears throat> are present and welcome to those who are watching and listening on the internet. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity of being together, being in person. And we thank you that you are truly present with us, even as you have promised where two or three are gathered together in your name. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide our thinking, our understanding, our believing, our conversation, our interacting with you and with one another. In the name of Jesus. The announcements are basically in your bulletin. <clears throat> Keep in mind that we do have Sunday morning Bible class at 8.30. And then on Wednesdays, um, for the time being at least, we're going to continue with our Wednesday 7 p.m. Zoom um, Bible study. And we'll be talking more about the Trinity. And it's an opportunity on Wednesdays to ask some questions to interact. Because I, I think there's something lost when you hear a message, whether it's a sermon or some other talk, and you don't have opportunity to ask questions. So Wednesday, 7 o'clock, Zoom is that opportunity to ask questions. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We'll take a moment to reflect on our need for forgiveness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, <clears throat> so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. 
and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join in the collect for the day, Almighty and everlasting God. You have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen.
morning. Good morning. The first reading for Holy Trinity Sunday is from Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Acts chapter 2, beginning at the 14th verse. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand now, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne... He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. We stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of John, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. And this actually, the printing in the bulletin is a different reference. So we read from the English Standard Version. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. We'd like you to remain standing as we confess our faith in the triune God. We use the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So here we are, Trinity Sunday, our second Sunday that we have been meeting in person. And what's it all about? 
Well, we wanted to use the creed and thought it would be good to use it before our message so we can think in terms of this trinity. The word trinity, you know, it does not appear in the Bible. And some would say, what is this? Why are you emphasizing the trinity? And the trinity is not even in the Bible. Well, the word of trinity is not in the Bible. And trinity, the word itself, means three. Now, probably most of us have thought about trinity. Well, it doesn't mean three in one. Well, in one sense, I suppose you could say it, it does. But in terms of the word trinity, it really just means three. We get the idea of three in one from the creeds. And what do we mean when it's, we speak about three in one? The meaning is that there are three persons, as we would say, but there's only one God. We are monotheists. We are people who believe in one God, just like the Jewish people are monotheists. Muslims, the father of Islam, followers of Islam, are also believers in one God. And so the question comes up sometimes, um, do we therefore all believe in the same God? And some would say, well, that depends on what you mean by the same God. But if you're thinking about the Trinity, the three in one, that is a unique understanding of God. It's not something that comes to us in a flash when we're converted, but it's something that we grow in our understanding of as we read the Bible, as we think about what the Bible is saying to us. For the Bible clearly speaks about a father, creator of the universe, a son, and the Holy Spirit. We pick that up even from the scriptures in great clarity. What's the great commission that we should go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Baptism is kind of a beginning. So I suppose you could say that the understanding of Trinity is something that is of significant meaning and purpose if it's something that we are baptized into. On the other hand, there are a lot of, quote, Christians who become Christians without really knowing about the Trinity. How did you become a Christian? Perhaps it was through infant baptism, when God, through your parents, in a sense, selected you and entered into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, through his word, grew in you, Baptism is the beginning of our relationship with God, but it's not the end of our relationship with God. It goes on and on, doesn't it? But there are individuals who were not baptized as infants and later on in their life heard the message and the message made sense. Not because they were such smart people, but because the Holy Spirit worked in their heart and mind. Jesus said, I did not come for the healthy, but for the sick. And obviously, if we're sick, if we're hurting, if we're burdened down with guilt, we have a greater receptivity, don't we? We're looking for something. We're looking for a rescue. We're looking for 
some help. We're looking for a way out. And the gospel, we say, is good news. That's what it means. Good news. Good news for a hurting people. Good news for you and me as we look at the emptiness in our life, perhaps, the anxiety in our life, the guilt that we bear for bad choices, for things that we have said and done that have hurt others, or for opportunities that were missed. And don't we all have those experiences in our life? You don't have to be married to have those experiences. But if you're married, you probably have been made aware of those shortcomings and failures in your life. You don't have to have children to be aware of those shortcomings and failures. But if you have children, they probably, at least on some occasion, have pointed out to you that you haven't always been the parent that I wanted to have. Indeed, as children, from the earliest of ages, we start out with thinking, the whole world revolves around me. You see something? Mine. It might be somebody else's, but in my mind, it's mine. And it's not that we are eager to share, because the whole world revolves around us, doesn't it? As infants, toddlers, young children? Do we ever really outgrow that? We sometimes, hopefully, control it. And we have this Holy Spirit that dwells within us, and so we feed that spiritual aspect of us, that relationship with God, so that there's less of this mind mentality and more of the you mentality and even of the thou mentality. For our minds, as that church father put it, are restless, aren't they, until they rest in you. So where does the Trinity fit in all this? Do any of you know the story of Nicky Cruz? Anybody know Nicky Cruz? Oh, at least we have Sherry. She knows about Nicky Cruz. Sherry and I are old enough to know about Nicky, but I, I have a hunch that some of you have the age requirement about knowing Nicky Cruz. It was in the 50s that Nicky Cruz was one of those warlords in New York City. He was a leader in the Mau Mau's. And there was a preacher in Pennsylvania who read the newspaper about all the gang conflict in New York City. His name was David Wilkerson. Anybody remember David Wilkerson? He was the one who wrote the book, The Cross and the Switchblade. It was made into a movie. David Wilkerson read about this. And can you imagine? Here he is, a preacher in Pennsylvania, reads about how bad things are in New York City. Those young hoodlums, those gang members, those warring teenagers. So what does David Wilkerson do? He packs up his Bible and hops in his car, and he drives to New York City. You might say he has rocks in his head. There's something wrong with him. Others might say he has the Holy Spirit in him. And so he relates to, he preaches to these gang members. And the one gang member, leader, 
Nikki Cruz, this Puerto Rican hellraiser in New York City, becomes a Christian in 1958. In 1968, he writes a book, an autobiography up to that point in his life, called Run, Baby, Run. And that, too, was made into a movie. You can go to your YouTube and pick up some of these stories. Dave Wilkerson, Cross and Switchblade, Nikki Cruz. So he writes his Run, Baby, Run in 1968. In 1976, he writes another book. He writes a book which seems highly unusual that he should write a book about the topic that he writes on. The book is titled The Magnificent Three, and it's not the best seller. It doesn't sell like Run, Baby, Run, but it has some of the same accounts of amazing conversions of gang members, of prostitutes. But the point of the Magnificence Three, you may have already surmised what he's talking about, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To quote his words, something has emerged in my walk with God that has become the most important element of my discipleship. It has become the thing that sustains me, that feeds me, that keeps me steady when I am shaky. I have come to see God, to know him, to relate to him as three in one. God as Trinity. God as Father, Savior, and Holy Spirit. God has given me given to me over the years a vision of himself as three in one. And the ability to relate to God in that way is the single most important fact of my Christian growth. Now that seems kind of remote from being a hell-raising gang leader in New York City, doesn't it? How can something like that be? You see, he really didn't know much anything about the Trinity when he became a Christian. He writes, when I first became a Christian, I knew nothing about anything so far as the things of God were concerned. I was a totally ignorant man. I knew nothing but Jesus reached me despite my ignorance of him. Now, we might say that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And if that's what we say, we'd be absolutely correct. He goes on to say in kind of prose style, but then he transitions into prayer mode. Listen to his writing I remember when I saw the real Jesus for the first time. Suddenly I saw you as you really were. I saw that you were human, just like me. I saw that you had courage. You had guts. You had something I could, couldn't describe, something I had never seen before, something incredibly strong and tender all at the same time. I saw that you had the power to squash me like a bug. And instead, you poured out your blood to save me, to love me, to heal me, my aching heart. He wants to forgive you of your sin, he writes. He wants to heal you of your sickness. He wants to keep you from anxiety and fear and guilt. He wants to free you from every kind of bondage, and he is there with you now to do it. He is a wonderful, magnificent Savior. 
the Magnificent Three. Magnificent Father, it's more than a figure of speech. He created me, but now also because he adopted me as his child, I am his creature, but more than I am his, that I am his adopted son. Nikki Cruz continues on. God is a magnificent father. God is a magnificent savior, Jesus Christ. But if it were not for the magnificent Holy Spirit, I would still be a wretched, hateful sinner. It is not enough to have a father God who loves and provides for me. It's not enough even to have a savior who died for my sins. For any of those blessings to make a difference in our lives, there must also be present in this world that third person, the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing how a gang leader should speak in those terms? He continues on, Jesus saved me. The Father forgave me, but the Holy Spirit convicted me brought me to my knees and showed me God. He showed me Jesus Christ, and I was gripped by his strong, sweet love. And then he shoved me toward God, and I gladly fell into the arms of my loving Father. He says, I don't know everything there is to know about theology. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm just a Puerto Rican street kid whom God picked up from the slums in New York and made into a disciple and minister. But there is one thing I know. I know that God is my father. He also makes sure nobody can mistake his book for systematic theology. This is not a doctrinal treatise on the Trinity. It is not a theological statement. I am not capable of that. It is a personal statement, a testimony, a simple sharing of how God, the magnific magnificent three, lives in my life every day. Though Nikki Cruz had gained no new information, he wrote in his gra grasp of the Trinity about how it had changed his life. And what Cruz experienced in his Trinitarian awakening was a kind of shift in how he perceived the same idea. First, he saw the Trinity as a difficult doctrine that had to be accepted, but could hardly be explained. Then he went on to see it as an illuminating doctrine that explained what he read in the Bible and what he experienced in his actual Christian life. Whereas he first encountered the doctrine as a problem, he came to understand it as a solution. Why have three persons, I thought, when it confuses me so much? It seemed to me such a totally unnecessary complication. Why couldn't God just be God? Then I could understand him. This Trinity business I accepted by faith, but I could not relate to it at all. But then the transformation in his life took place, and he realized that the things described in the doctrine were things he was already in contact with. He knew Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit through their work in his life. The doctrine of the Trinity was the key to understanding that those three experiences belonged together because the God behind them was one God, making himself known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, precisely because he eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I understand that God is so much more to me as three in one than he ever could be in any other way. Cruz goes on to write, I know how much easier it is for me to relate to him in that day today way because he is three. He's not talking about theology in a technical sense but he's expressing how he has grown in the word of God. In his Christian walk, 
in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so, as we think of the Trinity, we ought not to think about it as just some kind of strange teaching that we should try to gender up enough belief in to say that, yes, I believe in the Trinity. But we should let the Holy Spirit guide us in our reading and meditating the word, in our worship, that we might better understand God. Now, if you want to build a relationship with someone, whether it's a teenager dating someone, whether it's in a marriage relationship, or just a good friend, you want to get to know that person, don't you? You want to hear more about that person, understand more about that person. Because as you grow in your understanding about somebody that you care for, you connect more with that person. Ideally, we should all have some individuals on the human level that we grow with in our love and knowledge of. It's essential for our well-being to certainly have God as that person that we grow in our understanding. But it's not one person. It's a loving Heavenly Father. It's our brother, Jesus Christ, who's also our Lord and Savior. And it's the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who transforms our thinking, who gets us away from that me mentality that the toddler has into the you mentality and the thou mentality that makes us whole, healthy people. Not because we are completely without sin, but because we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, God the Father's Son from eternity, made real by the power of the Holy Spirit. And because we have fed that hunger that you and I have to know him better by reading the scriptures, by discussing the faith, sharing the faith with one another, with those who are closest to us, as well as those who are fellow members of the body of Christ. God has made each of us for a purpose, hasn't he? No matter what our age, no matter what our gender, no matter what our nationality, no matter how good our brain is or our body is, no matter how wealthy we are or how poor we are, God has made us one in Jesus Christ. Even as that fabulous three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. May God grant it to each of us. Amen.
Father, we thank you that you have not only wonderfully made us, but even though we turned our back on you and went astray, that you nevertheless sent us your son, Jesus, that you allowed us to put our sins on him, and that you took away those sins by his shed blood on the cross. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that makes the gift of your Son, Jesus, real to us. We thank you that you have promised to always be with us, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. For sometimes life is lonely Sometimes we do those things that separate us from others, but we give you thanks that there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, that you have reconciled us through your Son, Jesus, that you bring us together even when we would drive us apart. We pray, O Lord, that you would continue the good work begun in each of us, that we might honor you, that we might truly be a blessing to those that you have placed around us, to our family, to friends, to fellow members of the body of Christ, and to those who do not even know you. May others see the way in which we live our life and give you thanks and praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This Memorial Day weekend, we also think of those who have given their life for our nation, for freedom. We thank you for this nation in which we live, for those who have served in the military, those who have sacrificed for us and for others. We thank you that those who have sacrificed, you have loved, loved to the uttermost, that you have been with them in their living and in their dying, in their life of being wounded, whether it's a physical wound or post-traumatic stress, You know the brokenness of their lives, even as you know the brokenness of our lives. And we give you thanks for your great love, for your healing mercy, for your forgiveness of their sins and our sins. And Lord, we also offer up our prayers in behalf of our nation, the leaders of our country, those who are in positions of leadership, whether it's through election or appointment. We pray, Lord, 
that you would use these leaders of our nation, the nations of the world as well, our state, our communities, our cities, that you would use them for your holy purposes. We pray for peace and justice in our land, in our world. We pray that your good and gracious will will be done, even through us. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who have been identified in our bulletin, those who are having special needs, needs for healing, needs for comfort, for those who have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that we might not only pray in words, but that we might live out in deeds. Show us how we can be a help, a blessing, a comfort, an encouragement, a strength, a help to others in need. Lord, in your mercy. And we also join in the prayer which you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Have a great Memorial Day weekend.